Well, winning ugly is still winning, as they say, and Coco Goff has done just that on day 10 of the Australian Open, taking out Marta Kostuk in a really unusual three-setter. It was a wacky three-setter, Robbie Koenig. It was, and we like it a little bit of wacky, and I think it's appropriate that Brad Gilbert was in the box, given you're talking about winning ugly, yeah. right, boys? So, um, yeah, sometimes you just got to find a way, and uh, Asa and I will delve into you know, the analytics of it, but sometimes it's also about what's between the years, right? and how you handle yourself on those bad days, finding a way to win. If there's one hole that you can poke in an opponent's game, having you know the mental nous to figure it out. And I think Coco did that better than Marta today. Um, and I think that's where emotional control comes in. I thought she, she handled herself better mentally. She looked a little bit stable. And I think when you're in a better frame of mind, you find solutions easier, Si. Yeah, I think Robbie's touched on some great points because the numbers, as you might expect, having watched the match, guys, the numbers are up, down, and all over the shop. Mm. So it's re really nigh on impossible to make sense <laughs> of it from a, a data perspective. And ultimately, I think Robbie's right. It came down to the supreme competitive effort. And my sense is that if you want to hold up a Grand Slam trophy, you need to navigate your way through one, at least one, very, very difficult match. And my mm. sense is perhaps that this was the match for Goff in terms of her 2024 Australian Open campaign. So three hours and eight minutes on the court today her entire four matches leading up to this point the first four rounds four hours and 48 minutes yeah, so she's not far off parity or, or being on par there with that one match today under the blazing hot sun as compared to what we saw from her across her first four matches her second longest match that she's played in her career robbie yep. um in set one she trailed 5-1 against the ukrainian knew she had to change things she said in her press conference that she just had to keep fighting and she did that one five in a row and despite facing set point against her in that tie break she got over the line but it's interesting if you rewind to the post-match interview of, uh, after the match when she talks about she was just trying to add a bit of respectability to the scoreboard. She was just trying to get one game, right? So that's where it starts. That was the goal. Yeah, you don't think about the comeback in such big margins because that's, it's actually becomes off-putting. Oh, five games, struggling to win one. How difficult is that? Okay, let me just try and get one game here. 6-2 is not as bad as 6-1, double amount of games. You start playing all these uh, tricks with your mind just to, to make yourself feel better. And as she said, one became two, became Five. tie break, exactly. Yep. Save a set point. Suddenly you're in the fight. Momentum has swung. And again, the ability there just to compartmentalize and go small picture just for a couple of minutes there, I think was probably the difference. Perhaps in the end of the day between winning and losing, she loses that opening set easily. Who knows where the match ends up being? Well, I think the Goff numbers, and, and I touched on them being up, down, and all over the shop, and, and clearly the competitive effort to drag herself back into the contest it was a, a, a massive factor in the match. In terms of her serve numbers, I thought quite unusually, 53% of her first serve points won in set one, down at 45% yep. of first serve points won in set two, and then set three, she only lands 33% of her first serves but doesn't lose a point behind the first serve in set three. <laughs> yeah. So I if you can make sense of that, you're, you're a clearly a smarter mind than mine. <laughs> Suffice to say, she elevated and, and brought her best stuff to the court when she needed to get it done, and, and she survives and advances. And, Si, that's off the back of losing the second set, right? So suddenly the first serve becomes, even though the percentage is down, uh, the, way she, you know, the way she plays behind it is, is absolute perfection. And, and again, you just wonder how much the psyche plays into the early stages of their third set. Mott has just won it. She's feeling great, given that she's going the distance. Is there a little bit of a mental lapse? I reckon there is. And uh, Coco's right in there. Uh, I just love that steely resolve that she has. Yeah, I think it's a great point. And I think the tactical adjustment that comes with it as well. So in set two, in terms of long rallies won, so rallies that have gone nine shots and beyond, it's one-way traffic. It's an absolute smashing. So Kostjuk dominates that category. It's 13 to four. Long rallies wow. one in set two. Set three, Coco's really aware of that. Keeps the rally shorter, dominates in behind those first serve numbers that we've described. 20 to seven in terms of short rallies, that's zero to four shots. Four, 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 four or five apiece, medium rallies, and long rallies when she, she kind of evens the ledger there at four apiece. So knows what she needs to get done in that third set and is able to get it done. Okay, well, she has a clean record in semi-finals in her two major semis so far. Hasn't lost one, but she will be taking on the winner of Krachikova and Sabalenka. How do you think she's going to look in, in a semi-final on Australian hard courts, Robbie? It's her favourite surface, right? She's grown up on it. Of course, she's been to the finals of the French Open, so we can't discount that. But, you know, if, if I had to put all my hard-earned money on what her preferred surface would be, I would go hard court. Yep. Uh, 
Sabalenka's playing well. I've always been a massive fan of Krachikova just simply because of the way she plays the game. But, uh, you know, given who's left in the draw, I think Sabalenka's the odds-on favourite now. Firepower, been there, done it. But what makes that potential matchup, if, we, if we're talking Zabalenka coco Goff matchup, it's the defensive capabilities that Goff has, one of the best movers in the sport, up against one of the best shot makers. It makes for a spectacle. And that would be my first prize if those two could go at it. Uh, and as much as I love Bob Bora, uh, and I love the way she plays the game, uh, from a selfish point of view, that's the matchup I want to see. Yeah, well, it's really interesting, isn't it? If it does go that way, it's a 4-2 in Goff's favour in terms of the head-to-head. -head. And, and Robbie, I think, called the match at the US Open final mm. last year between um, Sabalenka and Goff, which obviously mm. went in Goff's favour. Yep. So the head-to-head -head record says that, well, we'll put it this way, not many players on tour have a winning record over Arena Sabalenka right now. Yep. Coco Goff's won. And a 4-2 record, that, there's enough evidence there to say there's something in that matchup that's troublesome, that's problematic for Sabalenka. So... If it does go that way, I'm really looking forward to it. We will wait to see, see the result of that quarterfinal, Krachikova and Sabalenka, and the semifinal on day 12. Turning our spotlight to day 11 now, it's the men's quarterfinal, Carlos Alcaraz and Alexander Zverev, who holds a 4-3 head-to-head record over the Spaniard. Yeah, I discount the first two, because uh, that's when Alcaraz was still a nipper. So <laughs> Nipper, I like it. Put those to the side. Uh, so if you have a look at the last five, I think Alcaraz has won three of... Uh, three of the last five, so leads that head-to-head -head, 3-2 in my mind. That's when it really starts to matter. That's when Alcaraz becomes a proper player. The matchup there, uh, we both know, you know, in the serving department, Zverev's serve is a joke, how good it is. Um, you have a look at the return numbers from last year. I was having a quick look at them on a hard court, 2023. I think overall the service rating, which is a whole yep. factor, a number of factors that go into the serve rating. I think Zverev was 10 if memory serves. Uh, in that category, and Alcaraz a little lower on that number, but the big disparity for me comes in the return. Uh, Zverev's return rating much lower. Mm. He's round about 44 on the list of last year on a hard court, specifically to a hard court. So I think that's where the game will be won and lost. Both of them will be serving big, serving well, and I think where Alcaraz has the edge, boys, is that he's going to make more meaningful returns in bigger moments, and I think that for me that'll be uh, the, the difference between the two of them. And just also not as jaded, right? Another yeah. tough match for Zverev. Agreed. It's amazing with the condition that he has with his um, you know, his insulin levels that he's able to win so many matches yeah. like that. Almost it's 14 hours on court this week. It's a joke, John. Unbelievable. Yeah, look, I echo those sentiments. And I do wonder whether physicality and, and time on court and energy spent, if you like, to this point in the tournament becomes a factor in this match because um, I think Alcaraz is fresh, rearing to go and ready to deliver some of his best tennis on the bigger stages. Um, and that's what we've we've got to look forward to tomorrow and, and potentially into the weekend as, as we look ahead. The only other thing I, I would add to that matchup as well is the forehands. How both forehands hold up. Now, Alcaraz, yeah. we know, has got one of the best forehands. But when he doesn't play well, that thing gets sprayed. And some of the matches that he lost last year, it's the forehand that lets him down despite the far power that he's got. Similarly, for Zverev, the shot that leaks errors, the forehand. How mm. well will they exploit each other's forehands when they get the opportunity? So that's something for for the folks at home to keep an eye on. I think Robbie's described it really nicely. I think it's the sixth rated server on all surfaces against all players from a 2023 perspective on the ATP Tour and Zverev up against the second rated returner on all surfaces against all players in Alcaraz. So mm. Robbie's given that that matchup, uh, I think, good voice. Um, and I think the winner of that tug of war goes a long way to getting it done tomorrow. Final predictions? Uh, Alcaraz and four. Yeah, same as me, Alcaraz and four. Consensus here on the AO Show. Come back tomorrow for more of the AO Show from day 11 of the Australian Open. And to hear this episode in full, simply search for the AO Show wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to subscribe.